Well, I am so happy to be with you. Special word of welcome to everyone at our campuses gathering in person and to everyone joining us online. Are you ready for some good news? Heaven is bursting with joy, and God wants you to experience it. I was quite pleased this this week to read that a professor at NC State University has presented evidence that there are at least three food items that are helping to ward off coronavirus, green tea, muscadine grapes, and are you ready? Dark chocolate. Yes, there it comes. I've been doing pretty well with that. Uh, I saw this week, I had never noticed this before, that stressed, spelled backwards, is desserts. (laughs) Yeah, I'm doing pretty well on that. It can contribute, though, to what some wit has said are the four stages of a life of a man. Stage one is he believes in Santa Claus. Stage two, he doesn't believe in Santa Claus. Stage three, he is Santa Claus. And stage four, He looks like Santa Claus. (laughs) Usually we say we need to put Christ back into Christmas, but I don't know, with all of the stress we've had this year and knowing that depression levels are up three times, maybe this is the year more than ever we need to put Mary back into Merry Christmas, which is why I chose this theme for Advent, God rest you, Mary, gentlemen. God rest you, Mary. Um, It is punctuated incorrectly most of the time. It is misunderstood. It is not God rest ye, merry gentlemen, um, as if it is an invitation for a nap for some happy men. No, uh, the punctuation should be different. It should be God rest ye, merry gentlemen. And rest in Old English meant keep. So it actually is a blessing. It is a way of saying, may God keep you continually joyful. So it's a blessing statement. And uh, to bless someone is to speak a positive vision over their life. It is to want and to will for that person good in their life. Uh, That's what a blessing statement does. So uh, this is, uh, maybe you want to practice it with me. I'm just trying to tell people when I see them, God rest you, Mary. Uh, they might say, well, what do you mean by that? I mean, well, you get a chance to tell them. The, the actual carol, the hymn, God Rest You Mary, Gentlemen, uh, is a picture of angels speaking to shepherds. And they're saying to the shepherds, uh, the angels saying to the shepherd, don't be afraid. Um, I have good news of great joy for you. It is to say, God, keep you uh, joyful instead of you being afraid and running away. So um, I want to look today at this familiar story in Luke chapter 2, at this scene of all of heaven bursting forth with joy and, um, and invite you in to the joy of the birth of the Savior. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. It's like, it's like the veil between heaven and earth is, is, is torn back, is just, is just drawn back as if you were drawing a curtain back and you got a glimpse of heaven. It, it is really in many ways like a glimpse into the heart of God as seen through the messengers of God. So we see a lot about God's heart in Luke chapter 2. We see God's heart, and this is what I want to talk to you about, by seeing how God sends the news Uh, who gets to hear the news, 
and um, what God wants for those who hear it. And, um, and then I'll show you further that there's something that's really powerful about why this is such, such good news. How, who, and what, and why is such good news? Well, let's just start with this. We see God's heart by seeing how God sends the news. He- heaven is just, this is the picture, heaven is just spilling over with this joyous news. And this angel, an unnamed angel, uh, comes to make the announcement to the shepherds, and then a heavenly host uh, join in this incredible announcement. Um, it's a picture, what it makes me think of is um, it's like someone that gets the opportunity to share great, big, wonderful news like a wonderful gift that's being given. My wife, uh, my wife, if you, if you don't know my wife, you just need to know this about her. One thing, about, my wife, Ann, she just loves to give. There's nothing that makes her happier than being able to give somebody a gift. And she's one of those when she gives a gift, she just loves, she loves it more than you do. I mean, she's just so excited about it. You'll be start opening the present and she can't, she can't help herself. She'll be like, I think you're going to really like this. And, uh, and, and, and then you, you starting to wrap it. She said, you, you're going to be so surprised. And then you keep, you're you're still unwrapping and she says I hope you like it as much as I do and she you know, you know she, and by that time I'm like listen you know don't build it up too much honey you know but she's just what it is that she's just so excited to be able to see you light up with joy that's her joy and I think she's always been this way she was telling me a story this week I had never heard before when she was about six years old she was still like this she loved seeing somebody get a present and, uh, but of course you're six, you don't have much money, you can't buy people presents much. So you're having to rejoice in other people getting presents. And she remembered a uh, time when she was about six and she's in the middle of three girls and her, her dad had gotten her mother for Christmas a painting that, that Bonnie, my, my mother-in-law, really wanted, um, this painting of these daisies. And, um, the, you know, at that stage in their life, I, it, was, it was a lot of money to spend on the painting. Uh, 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 Ann's mother really wanted it. The kids found out because, because my father-in-law, he told them about, that I'm getting in this painting. You've got to keep it a secret. And so Ann was so excited that her mother was going to get this painting. And she said that on the day of Christmas, they were all, and the kids were saying, open this one, Mom, open this one. They wanted to open. And so they're all jumping around there saying, open this present, open this present, open this present. But Anne realized somewhere in the middle of it, she was shouting, open this painting, open this painting, <laughs> open this painting. You know, when you've got something that is such good news and you want to tell someone about it, it's almost uncontainable. And that's what this is a picture of. It is such big news. It's such earth-shaking news. One of my favorite um, episodes of, of my, I guess, my favorite program, the Andy Griffith Show, is uh, the one where uh, Andy, the sheriff, learns that uh, the, there's going to be a big gold shipment that's going to come through Little Mayberry. They're trying to route this gold truck to go through this obscure route so that nobody would know where the gold truck's coming. And so the number one thing was for nobody to know about it. So Andy gets Barney and says, Barney, listen, I got some news. I said, there's a gold shipment coming through. He said it's got $7 million worth of gold on it. Barney's just, it's just eyes are wide. He says, Andy, this is big. This is really big. And, and Andy says, Barney, you cannot tell a single person. And he said, tight lips, Barn, you can count on me. But Barney Fife, knowing that a huge gold shipment's coming through Tiny Mayberry, he can't help himself. And so he becomes loose lips, uh, Barney, big mouth Barney. And he tells so many people that by the time that the gold truck arrives, <laughs> there's a band out there to receive it. There's a big crowd and a banner that says, Mayberry welcomes the gold truck. And then Barney's sitting there when he sees his face is just like, are you kidding me? What has happened here? But that's the way it is with big news. 
I imagine the angels in heaven are around a throne and they're having a, they're having a conversation. I don't know how this works in the heavenlies amongst the angels and the archangels. Who gets to tell all the news? And, and I don't know, there's some kind of heavenly conference and the father finally says, well, Gabriel, you get to go and you get to tell Mary that she's going to be the mother. So Gabriel's, he, he's named, he's mentioned, we know who Gabriel is. He just gets the honor. But some unnamed angel gets the assignment, you're going to go and tell the shepherds. It is God's heart. It is the nature of God to fill you in on glorious news. It's what he loves to do. He's, he's like my wife as a six-year-old, but he is so in an eternal, glorious, infinite capacity. I can't wait to tell them. And the angels are ready to rush to Bethlehem and tell them. You see God's heart. He's righteous. He's holy. He convicts us of sin. He's grieved by disobedience and rebellion. But his heart is bursting with joy to tell someone the good news. So you learn. You learn a lot about God's heart by how it is that God sends this news bursting forth, but also who gets to hear the news. And these shepherds are uh, Jewish boys, uh, local, young, uneducated, and uh, unnamed. Of course, they would be unnamed. There's nothing nothing special about them. Uh, Humble, Various historical reports will suggest that the religious aristocracy disapproved of shepherds. They weren't as diligent, maybe, in studying the Torah, some of them. They maybe didn't keep up all the ceremonial washing, hand-washing laws, maybe didn't get to temple as much. We're not sure uh, how much they were frowned on, but they were not, there were certainly no elite class they, um, they were just there in Bethlehem. Bethlehem fields are just humble fields that are nearby. They're, um, and, and what's interesting is that Bethlehem is only 10 kilometers away from Jerusalem. Uh, in fact, I mean, you can walk, you can walk from Bethlehem uh, to Jerusalem. Um, and Jerusalem is a power center, a religious center. Uh, why not go there? Why go to, why go to Bethlehem? And go to these shepherds. Um, in fact, the story is so full of contrast. That, that's what makes it, that's, that's, what, that's what grabs your attention. Is glorious, glorious angel and heavenly host. And humble shepherds in a little town, an obscure, unlikely town. And the contrast of that. You know? and, and so these shepherds, when the angel appears there... They are terrified. That's what happens when most people you see in the Bible encounter an angel. They are terrified because angels are just glorious. They are not, they are not the cute little cherubim that we want to think that they are. They're the the little cute cherubim that would never, never uh, harm a flea, never. No, that's, that's not the picture. And, and our, our, uh, our carols don't, I think, get the story right. They're poetic, but they don't get it right. Um, sing choirs of angels, sing in exultation. Well, we don't have any evidence that there was any singing going on with this heavenly host. Hark the herald angels sing. Well, again, we're not sure they were singing. It just, they might have just been shouting it. Uh, angels we have heard on high sweetly singing o'er the plains. Well, that, that, that's a picture of almost cherubim-like angels just with a soft little melodious song coming over the shepherds. Listen, if that's what's going on, the shepherds would not have been terrified and they would not have been requiring an angel to comfort them. It came upon a midnight clear lyric says from angels bending near the earth to touch their harps of gold. But that's not what the picture of here. In fact, when we come to this uh, host, this whole heavenly host that, that appears, the word in Greek for host here is stratius. 
And it says that there is a plethos, a fullness, a huge number of the stratios, stratios. And stratios means army. Host means army. I'm not even sure why we translate this in our, in our English Bibles as there was a host. It really is. And there was a huge heavenly army that appeared. Uh, almost everywhere, that's the way this works. In fact, the Lord in the Old Testament, one of his names is the Lord of hosts. Like, uh, let me just show you in Psalm 24 at verse 7. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? Here's the word, the Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory, the Lord of great armies. This is a great army of angels, this heavenly host. And there's so many angels. Hebrews 12, 22, the writer just mentions, but you've come to Mount Zion. He's speaking figuratively instead of Mount Sinai. And to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels and festal gathering. Uh, some people have said, well, we know scripturally every child is given an angel. I mean, we have scriptures that attest everybody has an angel. What, what are there, seven billion people on earth now? How many people have lived forever? I don't, I don't, I'm just saying there are billions and billions of angels, and they are messengers of God, and they are heavenly warriors, and they are announcers of the good news of the gospel to these little shepherds. If you want to get a picture of what this heavenly host was like, it's something probably more like a, an army from a scene in a Tolkien movie, like uh, some majestic appearance in the skies. You, you know, the image that came to mind also was like a, like a football team. I mean, I'm talking about an NFL you know, football team with 325-pound, huge, strong men, 100 or more on the sideline, and then their kicker kicks the winning field goal with zero time on the clock, and they win the big game, and the players all storm out, and they're celebrating out there, lifting up the kicker. Some of them are coming over to the camera like five-year-olds saying, hi, mom, and these guys are some of the strongest people on the planet, but they're uncontainably excited about a victory. So this is what you need to see, is that there is this contrast between these humble shepherds boys and this angel who's glorious and this unbelievable huge army of angels that appear in the heavenlies this host and that host of army angels uh, they they are they are unable to contain themselves they can't even they can't they can't adequately express the joy that they have all of this goes far to remind us that the kingdom of God, the Bible says, consists of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And that heaven can't contain itself because there's such great rejoicing when there's one sinner who repents. If one person comes to know the saving love of Jesus Christ, it, all of heaven erupts in joy. Th this is to say that, that God doesn't feel any, listen to this, he doesn't feel any more excited about revealing the gospel to the erudite magi with all their wealth than he does to lowly shepherds. The angel that got the privilege of telling this, these shepherd boys and the heavenly host, they were beside themselves with ecstatic joy and all they were doing was telling some of the most obscure people in all of society the message. Well, that's what Jesus did. He was known as the friend of sinners because he loved telling good news to people that others overlooked. He was joyful to be able to heal a leper, to have a conversation with a sinful woman, to call a tax collector, to be a disciple, to have the little children that adult, religious adults despise come and get in his lap and laugh with them. He was overjoyed 
with the good news of the gospel. It's not the kind of joy that you can work up. It's not the kind of uh, joy you can just put on display. It just comes across like a childlike innocence where you can't contain it. All of this means, beloved, that whoever you are, wherever you are, and no matter how unlikely you might think that God could forgive you, that the heart of God is absolutely spilling over with joy at the prospect of giving you the good news. And it means, beloved, that when it comes to telling others this good news, that if we're not telling others, it in the end is not because we haven't had enough evangelism training, as important as that is. It's not because we don't make a discipline of sharing the gospel and inviting friends to church, as good and important as that is. But the bottom line is, if I'm not telling somebody some good news, it's because I hadn't realized how good news, how good the news is. In other words, if something is, is good enough, it's uncontainable and you're Barney Fife and you can't help but tell everybody. You're a child who says, this is a present I can't wait for you to open. It's the heart of God. So God is every bit as excited about telling these shepherds as he is telling the religious leaders. And here's the third thing that you see. And that is that you can see a lot about God's heart by what it is that God wants for those who hear it to hear. What is it that he wants for them? What does God want for these shepherds? Well, I'll tell you this. God wanted them to see the glory of the angelic host and he wanted them not to be afraid. He wanted them to know his wondrous power because that's what happens when you pull back the curtain and let people see the Shekinah glory of God. But he also wanted them to be close. And so he gave the shepherds a unique message and told them how to find the baby so they could go and see Jesus. Maybe, maybe touch him. Maybe feel the softness of infant Jesus' skin. He wanted, he wanted them to be able at the same time to be able to know the glory of God and know the intimacy of his love. That, that's, that's what the story is about. So I want you to know it's about God's heart. His heart is, I want to appear to you. That's revelation. I want you to see that I am God. That is his holiness. That is, he wants you to know that he's the creator of the ends of the earth. He wants you to know that he's got all power and might and that there's, there's no mountain that he can't move. There's no sickness that he can't heal. There's no problem he can't solve. There is no brokenness that he can't restore. He is, he is the Lord of hosts. And there is no devil that can stand against him. He's God. And, and, and so he doesn't come to the shepherds and somehow not let them see his glory, but he, he comes and immediately through this angel you see the heart of God because whatever a messenger announces is announced on behalf of the one who sent the message. And the message is, do not be afraid. God rest you, Mary. I bring you good news of great joy. Good news, the word there, is gospel. It is in the Greek, the euangelion. Good news means gospel, means the evangel, the euangelion. I bring you good news of, and you know this word in Greek, mega, megas. Mega joy. He's basically saying, I'm bringing you a gospel of mega joy. And, uh, and so therefore, don't be, don't be afraid. In fact, 
go, go, go find the baby Jesus. Get very close to him. Don't be afraid. I want you to understand this. God does not want you to be afraid of him. See, some religions emphasize the nearness of the divine and have so tamed a view of God that God's just in everything and God is love and God's wonderful and yet um, there is no sense of transcendence, no sense of great power. Other religions emphasize how great he is, how distant he is, how powerful he is, and yet there is no invitation to intimacy or friendship with him. And what makes Christianity unique is that the invitation is both. The invitation is both to know that he is great and that he is very near. The invitation is to know that he is bigger than all of your problems and he is so good that he has made it possible for you to come near to him. So I, I, he's, he is at his heart, especially say this to someone, if you're, just, if you're just investigating who is God, from a New Testament perspective, the best way to describe him is he's like a perfect father. And I was by no means a perfect father, but I tell you, I love my kids a lot, and any, any loving parent who tries to do a good job um, knows that you want both of these things to happen. You want your child to know that you have authority and you have strength. And in a real sense, uh, in the home, you have a, a kind of superiority, not in an arrogant way over the children, but in a, in a way that they, they need to know and respect. And, and I, I can remember when the kids were little, you know, like, it's, it's weird. It's weird when your kids think that you're just great and you're like, no, I'm not nearly as good as you think. And I can remember when Bennett was little, like he's two years old. And I remember one day we, we had some Cheerios out, you know, Cheerios and a two-year-old. You got Cheerios all the time. And I had one between my, my thumb and my forefinger and I, I, I crushed it like this and I just turned it to dust with my bare hand and he had a little kid trying to squeeze the Cheerio to break it and, and you, you can't you, you're a little toddler you can't do that and I was like he thought I was amazing that I could crush a Cheerio with my bare hand he had a little got a little older he had a little tykes basketball plastic basketball goal and, uh, and, and, and he thought I was amazing because I could, I could dunk the basketball. <laughs> he grown up and found out I can't dunk a basketball on any, any uh, real uh, rim at all. But you, it's, it's, it's a delight to a father or the child to recognize something of greatness in the father. But what I never wanted, even in my worst moments, I, I never wanted my children to confuse the sense of dads bigger and stronger with therefore we should be afraid of dad. Instead, what I wanted was for them to always know that my position of strength was to their advantage, that I had such advocacy for them as protector and advocate for their well-being that they could count on it. The, the few moments that, that I, I remember seeing in my children's eyes, that little flash of fear towards me, those moments haunt me because it's the last thing that any loving parent ever wants. I'm saying God's a father, and he's strong, and he's powerful, but it's all a power that he yearns to release on your behalf. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of mega joy. He's both. So we've seen something about God's heart by seeing how it is that God sends the news. We see who gets to hear the news and that tells you something about God and what it is that he wants. He wants you to know his greatness and his closeness. But here, here's the, maybe the most important thing. Why? Why is it such good news? Why is this news so good? Here's why. 
And this is what Christmas is all about. And this is what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. There's only one way that it would be possible that we could know both God's glory and his closeness. The problem with an omnipotent, perfectly holy and righteous God who is glorious in every way and a sinful humanity, the problem is not with God. The problem is with people. And because of sin, the Bible teaches that we were separated from God. And you can read all kinds of stories in the Old Testament. Maybe if you're new to the Bible, you might read some of those and go, Boy, it looks like God was really angry at what's happening here. The people couldn't even touch Mount Sinai when the law was given. There were so many laws to protect people from coming into the presence of God. Even Moses had to be put into the cleft of a rock so he didn't see the fullness of God. What's going on with that? What's going on with that is that God is perfectly holy and humanity had become unholy and disobedient. And so there was a huge debt that had been accrued. And so if something was going to be done about the problem of sin, it's like a really good way to think about this is if someone has a big debt that they have accrued. The problem is not with the one who loaned the money. The problem was the one who borrowed it and hasn't paid it back, right? But if the one who borrowed can't pay the debt, then the one who has that debt can't solve the problem. So who's going to solve the problem? The only one who could solve the problem is the one who made the debt possible by giving so much. In other words, the only way the problem is solved is to forgive the debt. If a debt's too big to ever pay, the only way it's solved is to forgive the debt which means that forgiveness is always costly. Even in human relationships, in our relationships in our home, if someone's going to forgive, it's not like, oh, we just overlook it, it didn't matter. Something gives. If sin is forgiven, someone pays. And here's what's extraordinary. God decided in his own sovereign grace to pay your debt and to pay mine. And the only way that a price that great could be covered would be through his own sinless life in the person of Jesus Christ who's God but a little baby who grows up just like you and me so that it would be a human being a human being and God at the same time that could pay the debt. It was an infinite price, and so an infinite gift was given. And, and that's what this story's about. Huge cosmic angels announcing mega joy news that's so great that they are just bursting with the opportunity to tell it. And shepherds who can't wait to run to Bethlehem and find out and see that it's all true. Here's what happens. Only the people who really, really know how little they deserve this gift and really know that God has given it, those are the people that wind up having unspeakable joy. God rest you, Mary. It's a blessing to say it, and it is my blessing to you this Advent season. May God keep your heart continually merry. May God give you the mega joy that the angels announced to those shepherds because the story has not changed. And in the end, this is not a story simply about an announcement to shepherds. It's an announcement to you as well. I like every year about this time to pause 
And hear these words of Luke 2 very personally. I like to put my name in there. Do not be afraid, for I bring you unto you. And put your name in there. Unto you, Alan, is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy for unto you, put your name in there, is born this day a Savior. It's good news of great joy. All of heaven is bursting with it. And I pray that God would cause your heart to find it uncontainable as well. God rest you, Mary. That's the message of the angels to the shepherds. And it's the message of God to us again this Advent season. And that's the gospel. Bethlehem literally means house of bread. Bet, house, lechem, bread. In Hebrew, it's the house of bread. And Jesus was born and he was placed into a feeding trough. And partly it reminds me that Jesus said that he is the bread of life. And so on the night that he was betrayed, after he gave thanks, Jesus took uh, bread and he, he broke it. And he said, this is my body. It's given for you. He didn't mean it was literally his body. He meant figuratively. It's representing that there's a way in which you take in bread that you can take in the presence of God. And in the same manner, he took the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant. It's my blood and it's poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. We celebrate communion or the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist, it's sometimes called, which means Thanksgiving. Because inasmuch as we do, the Bible says you remember the Lord's death until he comes. You are remembering the full finished work of Jesus. And so it activates your faith. So we invite you to take communion with us. Um, hopefully you have uh, by this time uh, some uh, bread of any type, juice of any type. And I want to invite you first to take with me the bread as a symbol of the gift of Christ's body on the cross. The body of Christ given for you. And if you'll take a cup, again, whatever juice you have, and remember the words of Jesus, that he is the true vine and we're the branches and we abide in him, the vine where the grapes grow. Remember the words of Scripture that is by the blood of Jesus that we're purified and by his stripes that we're healed, not our own. As we take together and drink, the blood of Christ shed for you. Father, we thank you for this otherwise ordinary bread and juice that we have in all of our homes and various places of worship taken together in the Spirit as a seal of all of your grace to us. Let there be healing and freedom and strength that abides. In Jesus' name, amen. In the saving power, in the saving power of the name. We believe in the saving power, in the saving power of the name. We believe in the saving power, in the saving power. saving power in the saving
gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and Blessed angel came, and undiscerned shepherds brought tidings of the same. How that in Bethlehem was born the Son of God by name. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. God has God rest you, Mary. It's not God rest you, Mary, gentlemen. It's God rest you, Mary, gentle ones. God rest you, Mary. It means God keep you full of joy. God keep you full of joy, shepherds. Don't be afraid. The heart of God is for you to be able to encounter his glory and not be afraid because you know that he's a good father who has only the best in store for you. So receive the gospel, the good news of mega joy. If you've never taken that step to say yes, it's just as simple as saying, God, I believe that you have sent Jesus is the payment for my sin, and I've got a debt that I can't pay, and I accept what you've done to make the payment for me. And when you do, it's like you've been given a check, and now you're going to deposit it, and you make it your own. And you just confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, and you're saved. And I pray also for everyone who's joined us today that whatever healing and whatever compassionate ministry that you need from the Holy Spirit, that you'll be receiving even now under the sound of these words, the great comfort of knowing that God has great joy and continually filling you with his own gladness. May the Lord God bless you and keep you and be kind and gracious to you and make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace today and forevermore. Amen.